All right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, today we are happy to have um, uh, Jesus Christ. Sasha. Sasha. <laughs> Sasha. Oh, okay. Sasha Alexandra. No, that's Sasha. Sasha Rana here today. Uh, Sasha started her uh, career at MIT as an undergrad, where she worked on dark matter experiments, and she fell in love with fiddling with, with, with stuff, I suppose. Uh, and then she moved to Princeton where she uh, did her uh, graduate degree under the supervision of Bill Jones, working on the spider experiment. And she has been working on that ever since. Uh, she moved to Chicago last year where she continued her work on, on spider. She's been to the South Pole, actually doing, doing the work on site. Uh, they took measurements, right? Yes. That year. After having a, a delay for at least one year, given the, uh, the the U.S. government messing up their funding <laughs> funding issues, but uh, but hopefully she has uh, has some some initial results, and she's going to tell us all about it. Yep. So uh, yeah, as Dan said, I work on Spider, uh, and uh, this is what she looks like. <laughs> uh, so this is our team. A uh, whole bunch of institutions, some of whom are sitting, some of the people in this photo are sitting in this audience, if you can pick them out. Um, some people are brave enough to wear a t-shirt outdoors <laughs> in Antarctica. Uh, and that is Mount Erebus in the background. It's an active volcano 25 miles from where we launched our balloons. Did you walk up? Hmm? Did we walk up the mountain? No, they don't let you do that. <laughs> you need permission to go up there. Uh, okay, so uh, just quick overview. I'm going to frame uh, what we study with spider, um, uh, give a little description of the instrument. Uh, as an instrumentalist, that's my favorite part. <laughs> uh, then I'll talk a bit about our flight um, last January and uh, how that went, uh, and the data analysis we're working on now, and then what's up next, uh, working on the next new thing. So um, I'm going to start at the beginning uh, of the universe. Uh, so. You guys have seen this picture before. Uh, the Big Bang um, uh, uh, started with a, a large uh, soup of uh, photon baryon uh, plasma uh, with small quantum fluctuations, which um, expanded. Uh, and as the universe cooled, you end up with this uh, frozen image of uh, those fluctuations uh, imprinted on the, the photons as they uh, left that, that plasma. Uh, and so uh, that, that baby picture of the or the universe has been free streaming toward us uh, as the universe has uh, evolved. And we, we can see it now with satellites and balloons and ground-based telescopes. Um, so this is what the CMB looks like. I'm sure you guys have all seen this picture. Uh, uh, so acoustic oscillations in that, in that photon baryon plasma created these uh, density perturbations, hot, hot and cold spots, uh, with a characteristic scale of about a degree. Uh, and you have fluid flow from the cold spots to the hot spots. Um, and uh, in, you create these local quadrupole uh, anisotropies, uh, which uh, when you look at them from line of sight, you get the linear polarization uh, in, the, uh, in the photons. Uh, and we can decompose. Uh, the sky into uh, we can cor take correlations on the sky and decompose those correlations into density perturbations and uh, or temperature uh, perturbations and then polarization. Uh, so we can de decompose those into a, a divergence mode and a curl mode. Uh, so E modes are we call them E modes are uh, uh, generated by scalar per perturbations and also by tensor perturbations. So um, uh, scalar perturbations are density fluctuations, basically. Uh, and tensor modes uh, are created by things like gravitational uh, waves, uh, gravitational phenomena, which you need a, a tensor <laughs> to perturb your, your space time. Uh, so, um, and those, so tensor modes are, will generate a, a curl, uh, but not uh, uh, but scalar modes cannot generate a curl. So we take the ratio of your tensor to scalar modes and call this parameter r. And that's kind of what people talk about. Uh, uh, so that's the uh, 
the interesting parameter that you, you hear about a lot. Um, so uh, uh, the basic perturbations that we see, the temperature and E modes, uh, uh, look like this. And these are correlations. Uh, so angular scale uh, decreasing to the right. Uh, and uh, you see the characteristic scale of a degree. Uh, and your, your uh, polarization modes are out of phase with temperature. And this whole thing can be described by six parameters. Um, and th this is uh, state of the art of about a, as of about a year ago, I guess. Uh, and uh, we can go beyond that and look at the B modes. Uh, and there we've got this extra parameter R that we, that we can uh, uh, throw in. And just uh, a, about a year ago or so, our instruments have become sensitive enough, sensitive enough to, uh, to detect a B mode polarization. So this uh, peak here is from lensing from intervening, intervening matter. Uh, and uh, that's a polar, polar bear data set here. And the green, the green points are from BICEP2. Those have since been updated. Um, uh, and so now we're at the, the point in time when uh, the, our instruments are now sensitive enough to characterize uh, this B-mode spectrum. So uh, what can we learn about uh, with this? We call this parameter R. Uh, so um, the inflationary paradigm is, a, is a, basically a model for uh, what happened before uh, uh, the image of the CMB um, uh, froze out. So uh, inflation, uh, basic models of inflation say that uh, the universe expanded very quickly and generated uh, large gravitational phenomena early in, the, early in the universe. And we should be able to detect those gravitational ph phenomena with this parameter R. Uh, the most generic uh, models of inflation uh, predict values of 0 0.1, 0 0.05 or so, point of a few. And so right now our instruments are just getting sensitive enough to rule out classes of inflationary models. Uh, so things are getting interesting. I think the latest result is uh, a limit of 0 0.07 on, uh, on R. So uh, this is where SPIDER comes in. We're, uh, we're a balloon-borne telescope, a uh, microwave polarization sensitive instrument. Uh, our goal is to look at primordial B modes. Um, we're also looking, because we look at the whole sky as we see it, uh, we're also looking to characterize the foregrounds that are in the way from our own galaxy. Uh, so we have uh, the first instance of the instrument has two frequency bands, 90 gigahertz, 150 gigahertz, with beam widths about half a degree. Um, our first flight, as I said, was last January. Uh, and we flew for about 16 days. Um, and uh, this is some pre-flight statistics. We were expecting about an 85% yield on our on 2,400 detectors, uh, uh, sensitivity about 140 microkelvin root seconds, map depths of 12 uh, mic microkelvin arc minutes, if those numbers are for, for reference. Bicep 2's sensitivity was something like 5 microkelvin arc minutes after a couple years of observing. So um, this is after a 16, 20-day uh, flight. So why bother putting a, a super sensitive instrument onto a balloon uh, and dropping it out of the sky? Um, so the, the main, one of the main reasons is to avoid the atmosphere. There's a lot that, that you can uh, get around by, by getting above it. So the main thing is that you reduce your, your atmospheric loading. The, the atmosphere is emissive in the microwave. Um, so uh, for example, this plot here, um, this is power uh, as a function of uh, altitude at McMurdo. And uh, at 30 kilometers, which is the altitude that the balloon flies at, um, you're, you're loading your detectors with orders of magnitude less power than, than at uh, 10 kilometers or one kilometer. Um, so you can, the, the, the upshot is that within a couple weeks of taking data, uh, on a balloon, you can, you can get uh, a data set that's uh, as sensitive as one that, on the, that was taken on the ground in uh, months or years even. Um, the other thing that the atmosphere creates is uh, 1 over f. So it, there's fluctuations that vary uh, slowly and, and uh, um, 
you, uh, you have to uh, basically scan your instrument faster than, than the fluctuations are, are um, happening on, uh, on the atmosphere, which, which limits uh, the larger scales that you can see from the ground. So you, you can't, uh, makes it hard to correlate uh, signals over, over large um, patches of sky from the ground. Uh, on a balloon, because you're, you're not looking at the atmosphere so much, that should be improved quite a bit. Uh, and the, the final thing is that uh, you can uh, get access to higher frequencies. The atmosphere is effectively opaque. Uh, frequencies are about, uh, about above 220, 250 gigahertz. So uh, uh, kind of the sweet spot for a balloon instrument would be um, a 280, 300 gigahertz uh, band. Um, that'll complement ground-based data and, and, and satellites and such. Um, and with uh, the latest balloon technology um, from, from uh, McMurdo, uh, we can get 20-day flights easily. Uh, NASA is now starting a 100-day uh, ultra-long duration ballooning program. So if we can get mid-latitude flights that are months long, then we can get even more sensitive data sets, which is nice. Uh, so, what is Spider? Uh, this is this is uh, what uh, what the instrument looked like just before launch. This is the launch vehicle. Uh, it's it's been suspended up here, um, and you can see six apertures here. This is six independent receivers, uh, and they're housed in a single cryogenic vacuum environment. And the whole thing is mounted on this super lightweight carbon fiber gondola. Um, and there's a lot of pointing electronics. Uh, for controlling the instrument, so there's a pivot up here, a reaction wheel down here, elevation drive, so we can point anywhere on the sky, and then a lot of uh, very redundant sets of instrumentation for knowing where we're looking at any given moment. So um, sun sensors, GPS, etc. And all of these things were controlled, uh, solar powered here, and controlled uh, with a custom electronics. A lot of the, the work on all this pointing stuff was done by people in this audience. <laughs> um, and so this is what one of the receivers looks like. Um, it's a simple ref refractive uh, telescope. There's an objective lens and an eyepiece lens. Uh, and the, the camera is down here. Uh, and the camera is cooled to 300 millikelvin. Um, and we use transition edge sensors with uh, time domain multiplex squid readout to amplify. Uh, the signals, and we have uh, cold baffling and warm baffling and optical filtering to make sure that the loading on the instrument is um, well controlled. <clears throat> so uh, this is what the spider scan strategy look like, looks like on the sky. Uh, the green, so each uh, frame is one hour of a, of a day, and the green outline shows what uh, parts of, of the sky are accessible given the limitations of the instrument. Uh, so the way we set up our scan was uh, we outlined this, this uh, black box, and we set a track point in the middle of the box. It's the blue line here. And we step in elevation um, uh, throughout the day so that the declination of this track point moves constantly with time. So um, the idea is that the, the center of our scan is going to be uh, kind of uniformly covered in, in declination. Uh, and then we just scan an azimuth, and we adjust that elevation every couple scans. And each of these lines here you can see uh, is just a couple scans back and forth at that hour of the day. Uh, and so early in the day, and as we're going through the day, the sky is rotating a bit because we're not at the pole. We're at a little bit of a higher latitude. So uh, you get the sky rotation effect that creates a bit of cross-linking. Uh, of the first half of the day's data with the second half. Um, and so you can uh, get a bit more information by, uh, you should be able to correlate modes uh, in the up and down direction as uh, decently well, as, um, along with the modes along the scan direction as well. Um, so, uh, and then this is averaging over a full day's data set. That's what uh, the scan pattern kind of looks like. Uh, and of course, so this is uh, looking at, 
along the bore site, we have a, uh, a bunch of uh, detectors that are looking over a field of view about 20 degrees. So you average over that, and this pattern starts to smear out. So you don't see these peaky, uh, the hits map isn't, isn't so sharp at the edges. So that's not a subtle scan, right? You're like doing 120 degrees. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, 80 degrees, something like that. Uh, the steps are actually really small. They're, the elevation steps are less than a degree. They're like fractions of a degree. Um, uh, so I, I just show the, the, these sharp lines just for to, for to illustrate. Yeah, it's actually smoother than that. But yes, it's a, it's a big scan. Um, and because the instrument is really large and heavy, we actually can't do a constant velocity scan. Uh, we have to do a sinusoidal scan. So the we do actually spend more time at the edges of the scan, the edges of the map than at the middle. So there was, we did a little bit of adjustment during the flight to make sure that, that we were uniformly covered the, the, um, the map. Was any data taken in the reference of the part of the screen area, or did you stick to the uh, Yes, we actually, I'll show some maps. We took uh, a couple maps of, the, of a, a galactic source here, our CW38. Um, I think it was a, about a 3% patch of sky, and this, is about, uh, ends up about 12%. Okay, so this is what, uh, uh, the kind of sensitivity that we were expecting before uh, flight. Um, so this, uh, the error bars have separated for 90 and 150 gigahertz and added in a model for foregrounds based on the uh, Planck analysis of the same part of the sky. Uh, and there's, you know, large uncertainties on what the foreground amplitude actually looks like. Um, so, um, yeah, so this, this uh, analysis assumed it's just standard Fisher error bars, uh, assuming 7.5% um, sky coverage over 20 days. So both of those are a little bit of an overestimate, but about right. Okay, so we flew in January. <laughs> There's the... Little guy. Um, uh, so uh, the whole campaign took about three months. Uh, we arrived in late October, and we spent uh, a good chunk of November putting the instrument together. Uh, so we, these are, uh, you can see these different half wave plates. So we can we can actually modulate our polarization on the sky using those. Um, little patriotic flag there. <laughs> yeah, Canada. Um, there's uh, uh, there's <laughs> a bunch of UT uh, graduate students putting together the, the gondola. Um, and uh, when we put it all together, we had a couple of penguin visitors. So there's a spider in the background. We were doing some, uh, some testing, looking outside, testing antennas and such. Um, and we launched uh, on New Year's Day 2015. Uh, all, sub all subsystems were operational except for uh, one GPS, <laughs> but it's okay because we had another one. Uh, we were at float for 16 days. Um, all of our data were recovered uh, within the following month. Um, and the rest of the instrument stayed on the ice shelf for another uh, nine months and was recovered just a couple months ago um, in full. Just because you had to wait for summer? Yeah, they, they, this was the very end of the season, and they uh, got uh, 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 one of the British expedition people to fly out there and, and just quickly grab all the hard drives and, and get out. Um, uh, and then they, they, they had to basically mark it so that if it's buried in snow, you can still see the flags later. Uh, and then they came back for it uh, in November. Uh, so yeah, this is a payload on launch. There it is. This is the launch vehicle called the Boss. This whole thing is a parachute line, uh, and it's attached to uh, the, the balloon flight train back here. Um, and this, I think this will work. Uh, maybe. There it goes. Uh, so this is our, our launch. Um, the audio probably doesn't work. It was, you might be able to hear it from my, from my laptop. But there's a balloon. It was released uh, on the ground. It looks kind of small. <laughs> but uh, as it expands, as it goes up in the atmosphere, this whole volume from, from this point 
all the way up is, is filled with uh, helium, and so it's the size of a couple football fields. Uh, and there's the parachute, so when we let the, the payload down, uh, there's this balloon gets released and the parachute opens and gently floats the whole thing down. Uh, so uh, the winds were a little stronger than they were expecting that day. Uh, so the, the, the boss, the, the, dry, uh, the launch vehicle had to follow the balloon pretty well uh, as it took off. And uh, you'll watch them turn around real quick in a second. <laughs> yeah. So uh, here he goes, right here. And yeah, so that's he's, he's about to hard reverse and let go of the payload. Um, the I don't know if you heard that that snap. Uh, that the snap that we that we uh, experienced on launch was the the strongest uh, acceleration. I think they've measured. Or that, that that any payload has experienced in the recent, right? <laughs> recent, uh, yeah. So that was fun. Uh, uh, so uh, this is the track that Spider took around the continent. Uh, one, one of the other nice things about launching from Antarctica is that the winds during the summer season just go around and around. So. Uh, if we had launched a bit earlier and if our cryogenics had lasted longer, we could have gone around a couple more times and taken more data. Uh, there have been flights from Antarctica that have gone for like 50 days, uh, but typical was something like 20 days. So uh, we uh, launched from McMurdo, went around, uh, ambled about uh, with the winds, and then uh, this is kind of British Antarctic over here. That's where we landed. And yeah, so I think the winds were dying out, and uh, either they were the payload just wasn't going to move anymore, or it would have gone out to sea. So we just said, okay, we'll come down here. And it was and it was sort of they could have let it go further, but I think there's a crevasse field out here or something, and and um, uh, this was vaguely convenient for the British uh, um, expeditions to go out and do recovery. So and and in fact our 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 uh, payload was recovered by uh, the British Traverse. That they they had their route go right past where Spider had landed and just picked it up and dragged it with them. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the recovery guy, uh, Sam Burl, I think. Just one guy. <laughs> I mean, I think it was actually just him and maybe maybe a pilot or something. Uh, they went out on. Uh, this is when they went to recover the data drives. They just gutted the whole bottom of the <laughs> instrument and pulled out the drives as quickly as possible and got out. So. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's the remains of some solar panels. It's the, the NASA instrument uh, science pack. That's uh, the uh, communications package. So, so how much you probably better get this? So mm -hmm. Uh, all of the receivers were recovered and are fully functional. We've made sure of that. Uh, the cryogenic tank, we would almost have been perfectly fine with just leaving it down there. <laughs> uh, we, we've built a new one since then. Um, uh, and I think a, a lot of the structure is sort of reusable. Um, considering by mass or by dollar. By dollar, right. By yeah. dollar it's what? Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're 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 well in there. They're you know, it's giant onion, so they're, <laughs> they're pretty well insulated, I think. Uh, I, we would have we were expecting some some work, like maybe it's some something just like came loose a little bit. But we, but we, I don't think we were worried about it getting completely crushed. Um, the tank is way too big and can hold vacuum, so <laughs> falling out of the sky is probably okay for it, structure-wise. Um, okay, so uh, i talk a bit about what our data look like. Um, I can't show too much, but I'll show some interesting things, because uh, it's actively 
objectively analyzing. So um, we uh, covered about 12% of the sky. Um, if we do a weighting by integration time, this is what the, what the HITS map looks like, uh, we get about 6.5% of the sky. Um, and this is averaging over the full 20 degree field of view for all six receivers. Um, I, I said earlier we use a, a, a half wave plate to modulate polarization. So we would, we would step that wave plate uh, at the beginning, uh, sorry, at noon and, and midnight on every day. And so um, our map units are basically half days. And so we can mix and match them uh, and uh, take cross correlations and, and check for systematics and such and combine them in different ways to uh, make sure our data is all consistent. Um, so uh, to put our sky coverage into context, this is what the sky looks like um, at 500 gigahertz. That was, you can see that this is what you, the band you would see from the South Pole, which by the two covers. And the spider region is kind of beyond that because we're at a higher latitude. So it overlaps a bit with uh, what you can see from the Atacama. Um, so uh, that's, that's what the, the dusty sky at, at uh, higher, higher frequencies looks like. Um, so one of the things that we did during the flight was we, we could send down a little bit of, of uh, uh, detector data uh, um, live. We couldn't send it all down because uh, the, the data volume was much too um, too great, it would saturate the, the bandwidth that we had. But we, uh, we looked at this uh, RCW38, which is a galactic source, and we, we uh, first thing we did was make a map. <laughs> uh, this is, I think, 15 detectors and 10 minutes of data, and almost no processing, just like uh, uh, mean subtraction or something that we did. So uh, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the total data volume. Uh, and you can see that the instrument was working. Uh, so I think I showed this plot um, last January, the week after, uh, uh, the week after I left Antarctica <laughs> uh, at, at a talk, and uh, this is you know first light basically, um, uh, which is great. Um, after a couple months of analysis, uh, we were able to get a much cleaner uh, picture of. RCW 38. So this is now using four hours of data. We did four independent observations of RCW 38, one hour at a time, when it was uh, visible within that green um, outline I showed in the earlier scan strategy plot. So this map is using uh, one focal plane's worth of data for four hours, about 0.2% uh, of our total data volume. Uh, and so that's RCW 38 in the center. This, the galaxy is going kind of like this through there. And uh, I am actually flickering back and forth between that and a, and a simulation of a reobservation re re of that source with uh, the, uh, the Planck map. So we can, there's no difference. <laughs> it looks pretty, pretty much the same. So that's good. Um, um, we use RCW38 to uh, do beam calibrations and also to do some, uh, some amplitude calibrations of our data set as well. Uh, so it's a good cross-check on the, on the CMB data set. Uh, so uh, currently, a lot of our time is spent uh, in low-level data processing, um, which is really fun or really not fun, depending on how, how, <laughs> how much you like to write that kind of code. But um, uh, the, the data, um, the raw time streams uh, are kind of messy. So um, this is uh, one detector, it's about, mm, I think, 13 minutes of data. And the wiggles, you can see, are the CMB dipole as we're scanning back and forth. Uh, the blue um, hash, you can, you can see some of these spikes uh, and periodic larger spikes um, are uh, various behaviors that we've flagged as not science-grade data. So um, our downlink antennas for transmitting data to the ground and commanding the instrument actually interfered with the detector. So we kept them off for most of the flight, but we couldn't turn some of them off. So you'd see every couple minutes, you'd see these, these spikes. So we had to flag those. You'd also see some cosmic rays and some thermal spikes. And actually, one of the interesting things that we noticed was that 
the, uh, the number of cosmic rays that we saw was much lower than, than we were expecting to. We, we, it's possible that we could have been completely overwhelmed with, with cosmic ray hits. Um, and in fact, if you look at um, I think the Planck data processing paper that will show you what, the, what their data looks like, and they have to basically fit out cosmic ray amplitudes and, and thermal you know, drifts from that uh, for over huge fractions of their timelines. And we don't. I thought it was, they didn't expect to get that many cosmic rays, but I was, I'm not I think sure. I realized they were, that, like WMF had been in like a solar maximum. Right, um, exactly, that, that was, that was a problem, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they weren't, they weren't in a solar minimum or whatever yeah. through the whole mission. Yeah, So, I, it's a, I think it has a lot to do, I think what we decided was a, the, you know, the cross section of the instrument or the, the, Substrates that that it was that that our detectors are made on and things like that that are make them more or less susceptible to cosmic ray hits. Um, in any case, it was good for us because then our detectors were a bit more stable that way. Um, uh, so, but we did we were able to pick out a couple of cosmic rays and just single sample, a couple sample uh, spikes. So you can just flag them out. Um, one of the other things we did throughout the flight was take these regular calibration steps you can kind of see every couple minutes took electrical bias step on the uh, on the detector and that's to check that the gain of, of the of each channel is stable so we we use that data to calibrate our, our gains and linearize them but um, we flag that data as not science data because it's bias stepping at that time um, one of the things that's not on this particular chunk of time is uh, we had some channels that would uh, come unlocked. So there's a PID loop controlling your detector, making sure that it that it's you know looking uh, that it's stable um, and and uh, there's a linear correlation between the change in the voltage on the detector and what's the temperature it's seeing on the sky. Um, sometimes those detectors will come unlocked and you get these huge ramping behaviors. So that's another fun thing you have to find. Um, and uh, and then we see things like DC level shifts. So suddenly your DC level in your detector changes by a lot. And that's you know electrical effects or we're actively changing the bias or there's one detector that's uh, grounded in a weird way and talking to a neighboring detector. And so we, we have to be able to correct for all of that behavior. Is any of that mean, so you find that this happens? Is it, does that mean that that channel is now having to go to the right yeah. Does it come? It really uh, so we, we would. Uh, we did have an algorithm that would attempt to relock these detectors, and, and some of them would come back, yeah. Uh, but mostly we would flag them, try to turn them off. There's uh, the control software uh, did a lot of this on the fly, uh, but you know the stuff that wasn't caught uh, by the by the control software, where we have to go back and flag and correct for. So this is very low-level, basic time stream manipulation. <laughs> Uh, so this, the, the amount of um, data that we flag, so the, the flag data doesn't go into the map. So uh, you lose by a square root of that or something uh, in your sensitivity. Um, uh, where edit the number of flags. Yeah, uh, or the number of hits per pixel or something. So our, our um, uh, the the fraction of data that we flag is in in flux because this this is active development, but it's it's something like uh, ten twenty percent right now, something like that. Um, uh, and it varies a lot depending on what we decide is really bad data or not really bad data and correctable. <laughs> so so. Um, oh sure. There's, there's scan synchronous stuff that, that we see. There's, um, uh, so earlier in the flight, we were taking much wider scans, as, as I was showing. And then later in the flight, to kind of fill in the center of the map, we restricted our scan a bit. And so the kinds of behavior you see there is different. Um, um, there's a lot of, let's correlate this time stream with this electrical 
problem, or let's correlate this time stream with this thermometer, and and uh, you know some things are well. Maybe this is a side lobe that we're seeing, some glare off of uh, some part of the payload, or we're looking at the albedo or something that, from the ground, or uh, yeah. So there's there's a lot of uh, trial and error, a lot of templates that we that we make for things that we find in the data that we try to remove. So once we've flagged all of this, the stuff and uh, the bad stuff in the, in the time stream and we've uh, stitched together those DC jumps, you end up with what looks like a nice di dipole. Uh, and this is uncalibrated units. Uh, so we've taken all, the, all of the uh, flag data and we've filled it with a noise realization. So we just estimate white noise uh, of, for that detector and, and create a random noise time stream and fill it. Um, uh, and um, we've also adjusted the gains of each detector based on the, those electrical bias stuff. Um, so that looks pretty nice. Um, last thing we do uh, is we do some common mode filtering and some polynomial filtering to get rid of uh, large scale drifts. So. Uh, I said that atmosphere wasn't necessarily a problem, but electrical crap is. So you see, um, uh, for example, a whole set of detectors that will see the same you know, large drift because uh, one of the channels on that, in that set ran away or something. And so you have to, we do this common, this common mode subtraction by basically a PCA analysis. Uh, so decompose into, into modes and subtract out the largest ones. Uh, and because the detector is looking at a different part of the sky, you're not subtracting out signal. Um, we also apply a polynomial filter to, as a kind of a cleanup after that. Uh, and at this point, we can do a cross a calibration off of the Planck map. Uh, so we do a cross correlation analysis in, in multipole. Uh, to get a calibration factor per channel. Uh, and then we can make time streams in temperature units. So uh, the difference in this time stream and this time stream is that you can't see the dipole anymore here. And uh, the red is what the Planck uh, data look like. So this is 15 minutes on one detector, and you bin them into a map and average them down, and you end up with I'll show you in a second a nice looking map. Um, mm -hmm. Individually, each kilometer or each detector transfers the stuff before you're Well, so uh, I'm, I, it's a kind of an iterative procedure. Say again? Is that just like a relative calibration between them? It's actually in temperature units? Yeah, it's, it's in temperature units. So, what uh, we actually, this whole process, um, there's some dependency. So both of these filtering steps are signal subtracted uh, before uh, we do the decomposition. So we need a calibration to do it right. So there's a little bit of an iteration. And uh, the way we calibrate is actually to create a, a single map per channel. So um, there's, uh, so we, we do a polynomial filter. Uh, I think the process started with we did a polynomial, polynomial filtered map, uh, created a map per channel, we did the correlation, we got a calibration, and we went back and we said, okay, we need to do this SVD decomposition as well. So we created signal subtracted time streams using those initial calibrations, subtracted off the modes, created new time streams, polynomial filtered those, created new maps, new calibrations. And so you, I think you iterate once or twice, and that's enough to converge. Uh, over degree scales or so, so uh, 50 to 200 or so, where, where we're most sensitive. I guess then you might be dominant, you might be partly dominated by the Planck's own calibration error, which would be those Yes, so uh, the plan eventually is to repeat this with WMAP or something, and check it, that, that it's all consistent. But we are pegging our calibration on Planck, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, preliminary statistics, we've got uh, a data, total data volume of about one and a half terabytes, which uh, funnily enough, I think, is one day's worth of data for SPT3G, is that right? <laughs> yeah. 
That's about right. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, that that's cool. Um, uh, spider's kind of tiny compared to that, I guess. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, right now we're cutting a bunch of um, bad channels. So we so on top of the flagging that we do on each time stream, we say this channel is pathologically horrible. We're gonna throw it out right now. We'll come back to it. Um, so right now, this is what our kind of flagging fraction looks like. Uh, and combining uh, these numbers with, with the NET histograms that uh, I've shown here, you get uh, an NET of about uh, six or seven microkelvin root seconds in each of the frequency, band, frequency bands. And so this is what our temperature map looks like. Um, I think this, this is state of the art. <laughs> uh, uh, this is a 150 gigahertz map. Um, and I'll flicker back and forth with uh, a reobserved Planck map that's been observed and filtered in the same way that we um, process the spider data. Uh, and you can see some noise at the edges of the map where you know, we start to lose um, coverage. But it, it looks pretty good uh, by eye. Uh, and it's a little hard to see, but these are quasars. Um, these, you can see small fluctuations that turn on and off. Uh, uh, so Spider caught some, some quasars, <laughs> variable sources, in, uh, in our map. Uh, and I think those same sources appear in the boomerang map, if you were to look at that, because boomerang's coverage in 2003 was something like, like this part of, the, part of our map. That's kind of neat. Um, well, now that we have maps, uh, I can't show you any uh, polarization data, but I can show you a temperature polarization across uh, null spectrum. So one of the things that we do uh, to make sure our data set is completely consistent is that, as I said earlier, take a bunch of subsets, take difference maps, cross spectra, et cetera, and we um, estimate what our uh, analysis pipeline is doing to the data and how, how the, that's biasing the power spectrum that, that we get out of it. Uh, so there's a lot of comparison to simulations and um, this is one of our null spectra, so <laughs> it's a little bit of a polarization. So that's the split, Yeah, uh, so the split here is uh, we, we chunk up our data uh, into 10 minute chunks and we interleave every fourth one. So we take the first one in every set of four, and the second one in every set of four, and then we take differences and cross spectra. But that's spider on the planks, so you take so, the spider on the planks and you No, so we take, we take these, this chunking and cross spectrum and we create a spider map, and then we use a Planck map and we do the same cross spectrum and chunking and differencing, and then we difference those. The idea being that the Planck map is, is our signal simulation. We could replace it with a constrained lambda CDM, for example. What if you just do two ways rather than four ways? Like yeah, yeah. No, th that's true. The the purpose of this uh, four way, huh? I just did these today. Oh yeah. Well, so the the, the four way split, uh, we're supposed to be able to pass those pretty easily. So uh, there's uh, and there's things that we're learning about how our filtering works that. Uh, Make this this kind of null spectrum interesting. So I, I guess I'm just saying you could do a two-way. You expect your errors to be larger, but then you take the planks. Any you know, you take any errors potentially in the way you reabsorb yeah. the plank out of the equation. Uh, so th ignoring plank, pretend that's a lambda CDM, lambda CDM simulation, right? You could do a spider of these without any. Yeah, yeah. So, but you expect some signal leakage, some additive bias or or something from just the way your pipeline works. So if you put a, a, a signal through, uh, a signal only time stream through your null analysis where you know the input, you're gonna see some kind of effect that you have to subtract off from, sure. from this null, right? I, just, I, think, I, I guess I just think that potentially could be two different nulls, right? Because you, you might get signal leakage and then it's good to have like a sim inject Mm -hmm. That really gives you your transfer function, which is, mm -hmm. I guess, what you're doing. But then there's just the data only. Um, so the, the data is a signal and a noise component, right? And we, we're, we want to... Uh, so sim, but this includes like a sim today, like a simulation. 
Yeah, with, but there's no noise in that sim, right? So we're just saying, what, what is the fact that we have a signal in the sky doing to, how is that being sent through our processing, and what is that doing to the null spectrum? So you, you have to, to say that your noise is consistent, you have to subtract off the signal that leaks in to the null. Is that, am I making sense? Sure, I just think they're two different, no, I just think they're two different null tests. Sure. I mean, yes. There's, this is only one of so many. <laughs> yeah. So, by, by wrapping themselves in Petri and Plum, it's actual data. You're just probing Plum systematics at the same time? Uh, it, well, in principle, our noise is completely uncorrelated from theirs. But, but for our purposes, um, Planck is a, a, a proxy for uh, the sky temperature, the temper the what the sky looks like in T. Um, so if we wanted to, we could create just a constrained realization using Planck T and create a bunch of pol uh, polarization simulations. That's the next step. Like that's that's what we would be doing were we to run these in many batches. Um, so yeah. Because we, we, well, replace Planck with WMAP, right? There's, we know what the temperature sky looks like, so um, in our p part of the sky. We don't know necessarily what polarization looks like because the Planck data is noisy. So you create a constrained simulation. Yeah, I guess I don't understand why there's any simulations in the deck. Why doesn't it just have a spider mind instead of having a spider? That's what I'm saying. I could have shown, shown that, but. This is the one I found. This is the one I found on the wiki. <laughs> um, that that you know, I, I was given the okay to show. <laughs> but yes, we're constructing any number of null tests, ones that include uh, a signal, uh, subtracting the signal bias or and, and not right. So that's where we're at. Uh, we have a couple more months of slogging through this, and then maybe we'll come out with a paper in the near future before the end of the year. Um, I, I can't say for sure because I, I don't. Uh, but uh, aside from this data analysis, uh, we're actively working on uh, the next uh, iteration of Spider. Uh, which provisionally is named Spider 2. We'll see uh, if that name sticks. Uh, the flight's currently aiming to, to uh, fly two years from now, and we're adding a 285 gigahertz uh, band. So we're looking at higher frequencies, get a kind of a, a better handle on dust. So we'll, we'll fly with a couple 280 uh, gigahertz receivers and a, and a couple of our 90 and 150 receivers that um, we um, just brought back from the ice. Uh, so the, the new, we, have, we had to build a new cryostat. The old one was horrible and leaky anyway. So uh, this is a new one. It's, it's almost done. They're leak testing now. Uh, and uh, we're designing a new focal plane. Uh, the detectors for the 285 gigahertz band are being made, made by NIST. And uh, we're using um, feed horns uh, for the optical coupling instead of the the previous design, which was uh, the lithograph dipole arrays, which I didn't go into here, but I could have offline if anybody's interested. Uh, and I'll just end with a slide here. Um, so Spider is trying to characterize the, the uh, primordial B mode signal. Uh, uh, we do see, um, you know, sort of significant foregrounds from from our own galaxy, so you need many frequency bands to decorrelate the, or uh, remove the, the, uh, the foregrounds from the equation and get a, a, a strong upper limit on R. Uh, and uh, so things that Spider does well are, are um, mapping a large enough part of the sky that you can get many uncorrelated bins through your angular power spectrum out to large scales. Uh, we can also decompose that large sky area into subregions and, and take cross correlations of those and see, you know, make sure that the what we see is an isotropic signal on the sky. Um, and then we've got 
the multiple frequencies that you need for foreground separation. Uh, and our coverage is nice, uh, overlaps with a bunch of other experiments, so we could do cross, cross analyses with uh, all kinds of other projects. So that'll be interesting. Um, that's where we're at. This is what no, this is, uh, I think this, was, this analysis was simpler than that. It was just a foreground, just a model, for, a couple parameter model for dust, and there's no, uh, lensing wasn't part of the equation, I think. That's it. Um, so, uh, uh, well, so the, the foregrounds are different at lower frequencies. You get synchrotron coming in, right? Uh, I think the point isn't necessarily to make a small, to have a smaller foreground. The point is to be able to uh, project out your foreground. So you need a better handle on what it looks like. So you need a higher frequency uh, bin to fit your model well and, and to do some to foreground subtraction. Yeah, so that's what the 90 and the 150 bands are for. That's where the foreground minimum in principle is. Um, I mean, you have them, you can't get to this R without removing really yeah. 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 But I mean, for, for frequency, you know, like before we have the uh, but then it's our right. position is much lower than it is going to, to future I'm not sure that's true. Well, it is lower, but you still want to remove I mean, I think you prefer to, re to remove it as opposed to get in the yeah. sweet spot. Right. Because that doesn't change. It can't be in the sweet spot, even at its right. lowest point. Right, you still high, you want to go to detail value of R, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you, you have to be able to have a template, and so you need a high signal to noise template to, to subtract off. Um, we could use the Planck data, uh, uh, but I think we, the 350 band was, was a bit high, too high of a lever arm, and then so the 280 is kind of a nice compromise, it kind of fits in between the, two, the 220 and the 350 bands on, on Planck, so it's complementary in that way. Um, uh, also going to uh, lower frequency means your array has to be larger and so there's, there's space constraints <laughs> as well and, and fabrication constraints there. So um, would have been fewer channels, less sensitive. So I'll just play with two questions also. You mentioned uh, the arrays. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. So just the 280 band is 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 this new design, and it's and the it. Yeah, two two of them. Yeah. So we'll, uh, the nominal plan is uh, 222, 290s, 250s, and 2280s. But you know, depends on how the fabrication goes. We might do more. What's that? Oh yeah. I I think there was some thought that went into it in the the phrase at all. 2011 paper, so yeah, it's about time we revisit that, that based on what we've learned since then. Um, but the idea with the 280 receivers is that there uh, is a minimal redesign to the to the telescope. So there's there's some shifting of the optics, and this the the array here is designed to fit in into the box that the original that the 90s and 150s uh, focal planes fit into. So. Is there plate here? I think so. I assume Rule is working on that part. <laughs> uh, I'm not actually sure. Uh, so the I, I don't know what state of development that's in. It's an interesting point. Um, I'm just curious. We're, we're battling some emission and in, in actual. Uh huh. But, I mean, we we don't use the sapphire ones yet. So. Uh huh. Okay. At 150. Uh, it's complicated. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, just wondering about Spider 2. So, would the plan be to observe the same kind of sky, basically? Um, nominally, yeah. Um, if yeah, so Antarctic flights are kind of uh, limited in what we can see. 
uh, well, it's, it's a pretty wide uh, region of the sky that we can see, uh, and we covered about as much of it as we could. If we launch earlier in the season, we could push um, uh, more toward the galactic pole. So let me. Set the size of that green rectangle? So the limits are. Um, let me let me pull it up. Uh, so it seems like you're stuck between the galaxy and then the rest. Yeah, so, so um, we have to stay a certain distance away from the sun uh, because our solar rays are, uh, need, well, they need to be, the solar rays need to be facing the sun and also the detectors can't look too close to the sun, otherwise they'll saturate or you get side lobes and things. Uh, that's, that's in uh, azim azimuth or uh, RA basically. Uh, and in, in the um, in declination, we're set by limited by the uh, the elevation arms. So you can't uh, look too far down, otherwise you start looking at your own payload or the ground. Or being or you start seeing the earth the earth limb, the earth albedo, the radiation from coming up. Uh, and if you look too high you start seeing the balloon. So that's where our elevation range is limited to something like twenty to fifty degrees. And so that kind of sets the the width of that. Um, I should say that if, as you go out to f higher uh, latitudes, the width of this changes, your relationship in it to, of elevation to declination changes, so we could see larger patches of the sky there. Uh, you go up, you go further up, not altitude, latitude. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so, so uh, with ultra long du duration flights, those would be going from uh, New Zealand or, or something that, that is uh, more mid-latitude. So we could actually see something like 50, 60 percent of the sky so from there. Just from yeah, I, uh, people put in proposals for, for uh, ULDB missions. One of the problems with those is that those are right now severely mass limited. Uh, so we would be able to throw up one, maybe two receivers on, on a balloon like that. Um, and the cryogenics are a bit more complicated because you need a system that will work for 100 days as opposed to 20 days, which ours, ours was already really big and worked for only 20 days. So. Any more questions? All right, let's say such again.